Hi everybody, I'm David DeCosmo and this is Preview, a public affairs presentation of Electric City Television. Unfortunately, the virus pandemic has resulted in the cancellation of a lot of events, even some services for people in our area. One of the latest casualties is the annual observance at the Wyoming Monument in Luzerne County. The monument, of course, is set in an area where there was a major battle. That battle itself is the story and it is the memory. But there's a story behind the monument itself. And Bill Lewis, who has joined us before, a noted local historian, is here to tell us today about the battle and the monument. This today will sort of serve as the annual observation. So Bill, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to have you here and we're not going to waste any time. We're going to have a look at some uh, uh, slide presentations exactly. that you have and perhaps you'll be good enough to narrate as we go. Be glad to. Okay. Thank you so much. So what I thought we'd talk about today is the Wyoming Monument and specifically how it came to be, the man who designed it and why it's designed in the way it is. Now, most people are already aware of the, uh, the horrible story of the horrible battle and massacre that occurred in Exeter, what's now Exeter, on July 3rd, 1778. Our local history details not only the brutality of the battle, but the horrible aftermath uh, of when the colonial patriots were forced to suffer during the battle. Uh, the patriots left 40 Fort. This is a, an image of 40 Fort, the actual fort to the battlefield and faced the overwhelming number of Tories and Indians. And of course it was a slaughter. Much of the Wyoming Valley was abandoned after the battle. And it took over three months after the battle in October of 1778, when colonial soldiers under the command of Colonel Zebulon Butler first returned to the area. On October 22nd, 1778, a burial party was led by Lieutenant John Jenkins they visited the area and they saw the tragic slaughter that had occurred. Um, they collected the bones up on, with two carts using wooden pitchforks to toss the carts onto the uh, cart, the, the bodies onto the cart because they had dried out over the summer. Uh, they buried them in a mass grave uh, near the main highway, which is now Wyoming Avenue. And it was estimated that between 70 to 85 bodies were placed in that grave before the hole was filled in and a mound was placed on top to mark the spot. Now, time and farming in the area would quickly blur the spot uh, where the bones of the heroes of Wyoming were buried. But fortunately, area citizens would not forget the sacrifices of the battle. As early as 1809, prominent members of the community began to advocate for a permanent marker for the graves of the warriors. Local historian Charles Minor, who was editor of the local newspaper The Federalist, promoted the cause and helped to form a committee to raise money for the monument. But the efforts went nowhere. In 1826, a new group was formed, but nothing was done. By 1832, interest in the monument was definitely taking hold, uh, but there was a problem. Nobody could remember exactly where they had, had done this mass burial. And the solution came out of a, a really bitter political rivalry between two local branches of the Democratic Party. One group was called the Hickory Club, and it was headed by General William Ross, who was a local politician as well as a state militia leader. The other was the Democratic Hickory, Hickory Club, chaired by Andrew Beaumont, another local uh, politician who was supported in that club by William Swetland, uh, the owner of the famous Swetland home. And of course, his father was Luke Swetland, who built the original summer kitchen there back in the 1790s. The two clubs challenged each other to be the first to find the grave. Now, William Swetland had the foresight to contact Philip Jackson, a man who had owned the land one time that the graves were on. Swetland offered him a $20 reward if Jackson could locate the grave, and using a six-foot iron probe on May 22, 1832, Jackson set about his task, taking only about two hours to locate the grave before seeing Mr. Swetland to get his $20. 
So to advance the cause of building a monument on July 3rd, 1833, a large ceremony was held uh, that was really quite unusual. While speakers spoke and preachers prayed, uh, a huge gathered crowd was there, which included some of the survivors of the battle, as well as a number of their children of those people who had been killed in the battle. And as the great ceremony was going on nearby, a team of men were digging. They were extracting bones from the common grave while others placed the remains into boxes for temporary removal from the site. When interesting bones were pulled out of the mass grave, one bearing a knife or tomahawk marks, the bones were passed around the crowd. Witnesses that day noted about 20, 80 skulls were lined up for display. Kind of an interesting display. The bone-filled boxes were moved to the safekeeping to the storeroom of William Swetland's store. By the way, a building that still stands on Wyoming Avenue in Wyoming. The boxes were to share the occupancy of this store with Mr. Payne Pettibone, who at the time was Mr. Swetland's store clerk later his son-in-law. There was no record, by the way, if they ever had any roommate problems. Now, some of you may know Mr. Swetland by the beautiful home he built that still is there directly across from the Wami Monument, a home where President Rutherford B. Hayes visited and supposedly took a nap after his speech at the monument on July 3rd, 1878. So again, let's go back in time. On February 12, 1833, sufficient money had been raised for the construction of a monument and a vault. Uh, one great contradiction as you read through the various accounts of the monument's creation is where the bones were actually placed. Hazard's Register, a Philadelphia-based news journal of the area, reported on July 20, 1833, about the laying of the cornerstone of the monument, saying the bones had been laid in the foundation. Other accounts say the bones weren't placed there that day, rather they were placed in the vault but people had forgotten to buy a door for the back of the vault and the bones were returned to Mr. Swetland's store. We do know that in 1832 a Colonel Erastus began quarrying granite stone for the project from Kingston Mountain and that a fellow by the name of A.C. Church was hired to haul the stone to the site. By 1833, the firm of Morgan and Blanchard was serving as the main contractor and the stone was being quarried now on the east side of the river at using Miller's Ferry to move the stone across the Susquehanna. By June 10, 1834, the monument had reached a height of 20 feet. The funds for its construction were all used up and Morgan and Blanchard stopped their work. Fundraising was completely stalled and would remain so until the formation of the Ladies Luzerne Monumental Association in 1841. The benefit dinners and picnics held by this all-female organization were sufficient to raise funds to build this structure. And in fact, the Wyoming Monument Association is still a all-female organization, one of the oldest in the country, and they own the title to the grounds. And now we come to really the story of the monument itself. Itself, yeah. We have a history of the battle, but we have a unique history of the monument that uh, denotes that battle. Exactly. So in 1841, a great mystery about the monument seems to have occurred. In the files of the Luzerne County Historical Society, there's a drawing of three monument designs, different but not entirely alike what we see today. One was drawn by a Philadelphia carpenter, not the design of the monument. The greatest indication of who did the monument is coming from uh, a fellow by the name of Thomas Eustick Walder. And here's an early view of the monument itself. And you can see, you know, even in, in the earlier, is that's probably from the 1850s or 60s, it, it, it hasn't changed at all. All right. Here's Thomas Eustick Walder. What do we know about him? Uh, he was a Philadelphia architect. His diaries talk about doing the design for the Wyoming Monument. Um, talks about being paid to do the monument. So he was a, a hired uh, hand. So we went out of town to find a professional architect to do this. 
Now, he became very famous, and I'll talk about it in a minute. There's one great landmark that he did, actually several, but one that's very significant to our nation. Um, so, again, probably the earliest photograph we know of, probably from the 1860s of the monument, when it was still the marble plates in the sides. Um, but Thomas Eustick Walder also did a lot of railroad architecture. Now, we're not looking at a miniature right now. We're looking at a monument he designed in the 1830s for the dedication of what's called the Newkirk Viaduct uh, in Philadelphia by the Philadelphia um, uh, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. And it, this is still in Philadelphia. If you look at it carefully, it is the Wyoming Monument in miniature version. But they had put this viaduct up, wanted a permanent monument to its construction. What's significant about the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad? It's the railroad that took Abraham Lincoln uh, from Harrisburg to Baltimore uh, as he became the President of the United States in February of 1860. So really kind of an interesting uh, thing. But we know for a fact Thomas Eustick Walder designed that, and it's identical. But um, he took the design from the concepts that were coming out of Egypt in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, the French, Napoleon had led raids on Egypt. Egyptian architecture, Egyptian design had become all the rage. And it was considered to be funerary architecture, funeral type architecture to honor the dead. And you know, you can see this sphinx here but there was also the famous Cleopatra's needles that were came out of obelisks uh, that came out of Egypt. This is the one that is in New York City. There's identical ones in Paris, in London. Uh, this is in Central Park. But it spurred architecture in this country. So if, for instance, we go to Bunker Hill in Massachusetts, we find an obelisk. If we go to Washington, D.C., and we want to honor the President of the United States, the Washington Monument, we find an obelisk. So, so too, obelisks were used all over the country. It was a rage in the early 1800s because this meant honor after death. And of course, Thomas Eustick Waller developed quite a, a reputation as an architect in Philadelphia. So much so that in 1850, he was hired by President Millifer Millard Fillmore to become the fourth architect of the U.S. Capitol. So Eustick Walder goes to Washington, D.C., and one of the jobs he has is to add wings as well as a new dome to the U.S. Capitol. This is the original copper dome on the U.S. Capitol. It was leaking. It was not working out. They wanted something much more elaborate. They wanted additional wings put on. So he is the architect of the Capitol. What he had to design these these new uh, uh, dome and wings. Um, he ends up there, and you can see the Capitol with the dome removed as they begin work in the 1850s on the new dome. And of course, something interrupts that for at least a little while. It's called the Civil War, but. This is as the new dome is being constructed, the, the dome that Walter himself designed. Now, the Civil War takes over Washington. This is just a, a print from that area, a street scene. Soldiers poured into Washington, D.C. like there's no tomorrow. And of course, it was not a huge city that we, as we see it now, it was a smaller city, so they needed a place to stay. So, where did they pick? Well, some of the troops encamped it on this swampy area, you can see the water that runs in front of the Capitol, but a lot of them actually encamped inside the U.S. Capitol. And here's a picture of the terraces of the U.S. Capitol during the Civil War, and you'll see on here cannons. Not only were the cannons on the outside on these terraces, but they actually took cannons inside the Capitol building, particularly into the rotunda, because the attitude is if the Confederates were to break into Washington, they're gonna fight them to the death at the US Capitol. 
So this is, a, a again, a classic Civil War photo of the U.S. Capitol. I'm, I can't help but thinking it's good they're gone now with the, uh, with the political debates going the on. The cannons <laughs> would not be good in Washington right now. Yeah. Um, but they also set up uh, uh, bakeries in the basement of the Capitol. And, of course, they vented the bakery things into the heat system of the Capitol, filling the building not only with the great smell of baked goods, but soot. And you can see all the different uses that they used the Capitol for. They slept there. They stored things there. Um, Ustick wrote to his wife during the American Civil War and said the interior of the Capitol has basically turned into a public latrine. So he was really disgusted. Again, you can see the construction that occurs, and they resumed construction in the mid-1860s. Um, it, it was mostly finished by the time of Lincoln's second inaugural. This is a photograph of the second inaugural. The dome was done. They were still doing some roof construction in front of it. But the dome was in, a uh, great dome that Walter designed in time for, of course, Lincoln's um, funeral service from the Capitol. Um, Usyk also had a hand in designing the Philadelphia City Hall. He was the second in command or the number two architect on Philadelphia City Hall. Uh, again, he, he did design the Wyoming Monument here in Wyoming. Um, one of the things he demanded that did not get into the monument until well after his death are these panels that enter into the U.S. House of Representatives. And these are all scenes of, of the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the, the Battle of Yorktown, the signing of the Par Paris Treaty. But what's one of the most prominent ones here? The Battle of Wyoming. So in bronze doors, as you go in on the one side of the House of Representatives, uh, you'll find the Battle of Wyoming. That's how significant the battle was in that era. So here we have it, a monument here in Wyoming, Pennsylvania to honor the Battle of Wyoming designed by the same man who designed the iconic dome on the U.S. Capitol. It's a monument that's been visited by Rutherford B. Hayes in 1878, President of the United States. It's a monument that's been visited by Teddy Roosevelt in 1905, and of course, by former President Jimmy Carter in 2013. So American presidents have actually come to the monument. It's again, a great historical national, national historic site. So when you think about the US Capitol and the iconic almost wedding cake design and elaborate design of that, also think of one of the other great American landmarks that the same architect designed and of course, that's the Wyoming Monument right here in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. When I, when I think of the Battle of Wyoming and, and of course the monument there to commemorate what had happened, it occurs to me that young people today uh, are remembering 9-11. And prior to that, they were remembering Pearl Harbor. And back into the 1800s and the mid-1800s, they were remembering the Alamo. Alamo. We were remembering the Wyoming massacre much the same way. And in fact, uh, in the lingo of the Revolutionary War after 1778, remember Wyoming was a battle cry, just like remember the Alamo was during the Mexican War. So, you know, remember the Maine was the Spanish-American, remember Pearl Harbor, World War II. This was, remember Wyoming was a battle cry. It was considered that bad, uh, a, a, a massacre. Has the annual observance ever been interrupted before? It was. It was started in 1878. It was canceled in 1972 because it came just a few weeks after the Hurricane Agnes flood. And of course this year because of the quarantine and the, the ban on large gatherings we had to cancel it this year. Only second time in 142 years. A pretty good record. Pretty good record. And uh, I'm sure that uh, it always draws a, a large crowd. We estimate we get well over a thousand people there every year. Bill, I'm certain you're looking forward to getting back to the annual monument celebration. We look year. forward to 2021 with great hope that we're we're all clear of everything and for a great uh, 
3rd of July observance because the 4th falls on the Sunday next year. So we'll observe on the actual anniversary of the battle, the 244th, 43rd anniversary. And, and ironically, it takes pretty much a year to get that planning going. Oh, it again. certainly does. Yeah, get a speaker and tents and everything right. that we do. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I thank all of you for joining us as well on Preview. As it happens, this is the last edition of our weekly program. I will look forward to seeing you on some reruns for various programs I've done on Electric City Television, as well as some special events that will be coming up. Until then, I hope all of your news is good.